Hey there, Facebook. And I'm now going live on Periscope. There we go. Welcome to <clears throat> Thursday Night Ministry, which is No More Genies. I do my No More Genies uh, teaching every second Thursday of the month. Every second Thursday of the month. So whatever the second Thursday is of the month, I'll be on here live. Like I am now at 7 o'clock p.m., teaching about uh, uh, different topics that I'll pull together on a banner called No More Genies. So I strongly encourage you to watch this series from the beginning. You can watch it on uh, my YouTube channel, so you can have all the videos in a row, but there's also a playlist on Facebook Live. And basically what I'm talking about is getting rid of the genie concept of God, getting rid of this magic concept of God we have where we think that somehow... Serving God is magic and that God himself is magic and it's spiritual spooky and, and it's a whole bunch of things that is not. The reason I'm so so adamant about teaching on Genie Concept is because Genie Concept has cost a lot of people their lives. People have died because of misinterpretations of scriptures or because of believing things about God that just aren't true. And then when you preach and teach and stuff, preach and teach stuff about God that isn't true and stuff that's based on magic, <laughs> just stuff you made up, just, you know, saying magic words, rubbing the magic lamp, instead of what the scripture actually says and what the scripture actually teaches, you know. So I talk about that in the very first video that kicks off the series. This is actually teaching number 12, teaching number 12 on No More Genie. So I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to go back to the beginning and watch the original video because I go into more detail about exactly what I mean when I say no more genies and exactly what it's done to a lot of people's lives. People letting their kids die, people not taking medicine, people doing a whole bunch of things because they don't understand that God is a person and not a set of rules. God is somebody you have to get to know. <laughs> the same way you got to know your best friend or your spouse or even your child. You had to get to know them. Okay, well, God is somebody you have to get to know. Okay? And you would, uh, if you get to know him, you'll understand that it's not religion. It's relationship. But if you don't, you will be hanging your hat on a whole bunch of things that will eventually cost you more than you want to pay because you have a genie concept of God instead of a personal concept of God. Okay? So let's jump into tonight's teaching. I'm going to start off with a word of prayer, as always. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we have access to your presence by faith and to this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Thank you that Jesus Christ is our justification and our peace and that you have reconciled all things to yourself, Father, through the blood of his cross. So, Lord, I surrender not my will, but thine be done. I ask you to speak through me tonight, O oh God. I surrender my mind, my lips, my tongue, my hands, my body, my thoughts. Fill me with the Holy Ghost and let uh, be said what you want said, O oh God, that you might be glorified, that what you want to come forth might come forth, O oh God, that wherever the audience is around the world at any point in time or any point in the future, that what they need to hear from you will come through my mouth, O oh God, because only, only the Holy Ghost can do that. So I'm excited about tonight, God. I thank you for an opportunity to serve you and be a part of the kingdom. And uh, we lift up everything to you in surrender and offering that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified, and that the demons might be terrified. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. So tonight I'm starting uh, a series of teaching on the No More Genies that I'm calling We Do It Wrong. <laughs> Again, name of the subject is We Do It Wrong. Okay. And what I mean by that, or what I'm going to be dealing with, I'm going to be dealing with several things that are commonplace experiences and commonplace teachings and commonplace frames of mind and perspectives that a lot of Western Christians have. Now, I can't speak for Christians in another part of the world. I'm basically talking about American Christians when I say Western Christians, and I'm talking about Specific denominational things, but I'll be getting into that because I'm not talking about the body of Christ worldwide because I don't know, you know, I've lived here. So uh, so I'm talking about 
some of the things that we believe and preach and do in the West, because I know it's not that way in other countries, but it is here. So, again, the name of this series is We Do It Wrong. Okay? We Do It Wrong. So this is We Do It Wrong, part one. So the first thing that I'm going to deal with tonight, and I may not get to all my information tonight, because as always, I have a lot of information. So you're going to need to watch this video more than one time, because I have a lot of information I'm going to give you. Okay? And again, I may not get to all of it tonight. But what I'm going to start out with is... The difference between what we preach and what Jesus preached. Now, I am not the first person to talk about that. So I'm not claiming that that idea is unique to me or that I came up with that or anything. Okay. I'm not the first person to talk about the difference between what we preach and what Jesus preached. But I just want to make it a focal point tonight because there's so many things, again, that uh, are, are just so off. And if you ask, well, who are you? David Taylor to talk about we do it wrong, but it's not what I say. It's what the scriptures say. That's why we have the written word of God. That's why we have a Bible. And it always amazes me how we can always have the same Bible, yet, you know, so many different offshoots of Christianity, so many brands, so many different flavors. But I understand that, too, because part of that is just the particular administration the Lord is setting up and the particular focus the Lord wants based on what part of his body you are. So I understand that. But, you know, I know I'm not the first person to talk about it. But again, it's not what I say. It's what the scriptures say. So part one of We Do It Wrong is going to deal with the difference between what we preach and what Jesus preached. And what is the difference? Here it comes. We preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to heaven when you die, go to church, go to church. Again, we preach born again, get saved, miss hell, go to heaven when you die, go to church. That's what we preach. That's not what the Lord preached. <laughs> What, what I just said is what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel, the English word gospel, actually means good news. So when we say we're preaching the gospel, we pre when I say we, again, I'm talking about American Christians and most of our Protestant denominations preach born again, born again, get saved. You need to be saved. Miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's what we preach, and we call that the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we do not preach the gospel that Jesus Christ himself preached. The Lord did not preach born again. Okay? The Lord did not preach go to synagogue. The Lord preached the kingdom. He preached the kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of heaven. And I'll talk about why the Bible refers to them slightly differently because they're the same thing, but we'll talk about intended audiences. But Jesus preached the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That was his main focus, and that's what he talked about more than anything else. More than anything else that the Lord talked about, he preached the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He did not preach born again. He did not, he did not preach get saved, get saved. He did not preach go to heaven when you die. And he didn't preach go to church, or go to synagogue. That's not what the Lord preached. He preached the kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Why is that so important? It's so important because the results that we get in our lives and the results that we get in our spiritual lives and our churches are so vastly different when you preaching and teaching the wrong thing. Okay, the Lord never once said to somebody, come to synagogue on Saturday and I will hook you up. He never said that one time. Not one time did he tell somebody to be sure that you go to synagogue or be sure you go to church for Protestants. The Lord didn't say that one time. So again, the, the results that we get about people, you know, going to church for 30 years and never changing or people living their whole lives and not knowing the Lord or people not walking in the power or not getting the results they, that they want or people saying things like, all that God stuff doesn't work. That's not true. What happened was, is that we preach it wrong. You told them born again, born again, get saved, get saved. 
Miss hell, miss hell. Go to heaven when you die. I'm on my way to heaven. and so glad. Go to church. Go to church. And that's not what the Lord preached. He preached the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, I want to show you how Jesus only mentioned born again one time. Okay? And he mentioned it in the context of his larger message. So we're going to look at John chapter 3. Okay, the Gospel of John, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So that's the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Fourth book in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. Some people call it Big John. And uh, we're going to start at chapter 3. And we're going to read down to... Okay, I said we'll read down to uh, verse 8. So here we go. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Wow. A lot, to, a lot to unpack. But what I want to focus on is when Jesus did talk about born again, the one time, the one time in all of the Gospels that the Lord talked about born again, he talked about it in the context of his larger message, which was the kingdom of God. So the Lord said, answering to Nicodemus, now, Nicodemus already honored Jesus because he said that the Lord could only do the signs that he did because he knew that God was with him. Very important. That's very significant. We're going to revisit that in a minute. The Lord answered Nicodemus and said, truly, truly. Now, whenever you see the Lord says truly, truly, or verily, verily in the scripture, because King James uses verily, verily, that's a word that means truth, truth. It also uh, sometimes is translated amen and amen. Whenever the Lord says truly, truly, whenever God does that double emphasis like that, he's trying to show you how true what he's saying is. So obviously everything God says is true, and obviously everything Jesus says is true, but he's trying to emphasize a point when God says truly, truly. So that means don't try to get around this, don't try to ignore it, don't try to make it be what you want it to be, don't try to make this be something else. Because when the Lord says truly, truly, then he's trying to emphasize what he's saying. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now there's the Lord's message. So the first thing that the Lord says, you can't even see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. It's the only time Jesus talked about born again. He said, you can't see it without the rebirth experience. But the kingdom of God is the focus it's the point. It's what God wants you to see. His kingdom. And the Lord said you need to be reborn to be able to see his kingdom. Now that ought to explain to you why unsaved people and unbelievers and sinners do what they do because they can't see. You do realize that everything will be different. Or everything is different. And all of you that are listening to me that are Christians, you know that the first thing that happens whenever you meet Jesus is that he does this. He opens your eyes. First thing that happens every single time. And as soon as the Lord opens your eyes to some things, you see some stuff that you didn't see before and you're like, wow. Because you didn't even know how blind you were till Jesus showed up. <laughs> so the Lord says, unless you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly. There it is. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, what is the Lord talking about there? He's talking about water baptism, and he's talking about Holy Ghost baptism. 
He's talking about water baptism is the outward sign that you have been washed and cleansed. Spirit baptism is the inward sign that you have been washed and cleansed. So in other words, what the Lord is saying is that you've got to go through the water and go through the spirit. What that means is that your sins must be forgiven. And then you must, and then you're born again, so you can enter. He said, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, in other words, the Lord says you have to be washed. You got to be washed when you get water baptized. That's the outward symbol. You go down into the water, symbolizing that you have buried the old man, and you come up out of the water, symbolizing a resurrection into the new man. That's the outward sign. That's like a wedding ring. That's the outward sign. The inward baptism of the Holy Ghost is where God purges you, <coughs> excuse me, where God purges you of your sins and God washes you clean and God seals you with the Holy Ghost. And that is the inward sign. That is the inward witness that, yes, your sins have been forgiven, wiped off your slate, wiped clean, and you are now born again. And then you can enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so that means if you don't have that experience, you can't get in the kingdom. And the Lord talks about that in other places of the scriptures, too, when he talks about how there's going to be unbelievers trying to get into the kingdom, and they were never washed. That's why they can't get in. But his focus is still the kingdom of God. Being born again is the entryway, but his focus is still the kingdom of God. So the Lord said, you know, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Then he said, you got to be washed so you can enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and, that flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Now, what does all that mean in plain English? What that means is that Nicodemus took what Jesus said literally. So when Jesus was talking about being born again, that's why Nicodemus said, when you're old, can you go back inside your mom and come out again? And the Lord was saying, that's not what I meant. That's not what he meant by what he said. What he meant was, again, in verse uh, 6, when he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is, is spirit. In other words, what that means is that when you come out of your mother's womb, the nature you have is the nature of Adam, the first man who fell, who sinned, and brought sin and death into this world. That's the fleshly nature. And also talking about your physical body. When we're born, when we come out of our mother's womb, we are separated from God. We are, we are born spiritually dead. We are dead in sins and trespasses. And all we have is the nature of Adam. And then you have the nature of your parents. So that's why you act like mom and daddy. Some stuff you do in your life you never saw your parents do. But you do it because you're the fruit of their body. So that's why sometimes people see you and you say, you look just like your mama. Sometimes people see you and say, you, you sound just like your daddy. Well, that's because you inherited your parents' nature because you're the fruit of their body. So you inherited Adam's nature, the sinful nature, and you inherited your parents' nature. And that's the fleshly birth. That's when your father's seed leaves his body, fertilizes your mother's egg, the egg gestates inside of your mom's womb, and nine months later, you came out. That's the fleshly birth. That does not connect you to God. You are dead spiritually when you come out of your mother's womb. You just have the fleshly birth, okay? The deadness that we inherited from Adam, from his sin, and then whatever, you know, strengths and weaknesses and proclivities and sins you inherited from your parents. Because Lord knows nothing makes our parents angrier than when we act just like them. You ever notice that? <laughs> if you're the parent or you're the child, you know that if you see your child act just like you in on the negative side, we just fly into this rage. And you know if you're ever a child, if you saw your parents do something they shouldn't have been doing or you heard them say something, if you repeated it, they got all mad. But anyway, so when you are born of the flesh, that's, what's that, that's what that is talking about. Jesus was saying that's the fleshly birth. That's the birth of your body out of your mother's womb. That's the birth of your father's seed growing into you inside of a fertilized egg inside of your mom. And that's Adam's inheritance to you. But then he says, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, that's a separate birth. That's a separate birth. So that's why you have to choose to be born again. 
You have to ask God, and the way to get born again, if you don't know how, the way to get born again is A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he came from heaven uh, and to, to die on the cross and pay for your sins and was resurrected on the third day. And C, confess all that with your mouth. That's how you become born again, A, B, C. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe on Jesus. C, confess what you believe with your mouth. That's how you get saved. If you've never done that, you are not born again. If you've never done that, you are not saved. You are not a Christian. And the Lord said that process is the only way to be born of the Spirit. And that's how you enter, enter the kingdom of God. So when the Lord says the wind blows where it wants and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Lord is saying, once you get access to the Holy Ghost, you, ha you have access to a whole other dimension that can't be seen with the natural eye. So just like when you look outside and you see the wind blowing, you do not actually see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. You can hear it. You can feel its temperature. You can hear the sound of it. And you can see what wind can do. But you actually can't see wind with your physical eye. Well, the Lord is using that as an analogy to let you know that in the Spirit it's the same way. You can't see the Holy Ghost. You can tell when the Holy Ghost is there, but you can't tell where you come from. You can't tell where it goes. And there's a whole other dimension you're now attached to when you're born of the Spirit. So the Lord is trying to make it clear that the rebirth experience is necessary to get into the kingdom. But the point of what he's saying, because he only mentioned born again one time in this passage, is the kingdom of God, to be able to see the kingdom of God, to be able to enter the kingdom of God, to be able to be attached to the kingdom of God and understand his workings. That's what the Lord preached. Not born again, born again, get saved, get saved, go to church, go to church, miss hell, miss hell, uh, go to heaven when you die, like we do. Okay? He preached the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And this is the only passage in the Gospels where the Lord talks about how you get in. He did not preach born again. You can't find it anywhere else. Okay? So, now that I've talked on that, I do want to talk about uh, the Lord speaking on hell because some people are going to say, see, this is a whole other thing. I'm going to probably do a whole other thing on hell. I just want to mention this briefly because there's four words for hell. There's the English word hell, which is not actually in the Bible. That's the English translation. That's the word we use. But that word, hell, as we understand, is not actually in the Bible. The Bible actually uses three words. So there's four words total. One English word, hell. There's the word Hades. There's the word Gehenna. There's the word Tartarus. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more. And there's Sheol. So that's actually five total. Okay. So hell is the English word that we use. Then there's Hades, there's Gehenna, there's Tartarus, and there's Sheol. Okay, so that's why you have to get behind the original language. So that's actually five words total. Four in the Bible, Hades, Sheol, Tartarus, and Gehenna, and then that one English word, hell, that we use. So there's, there's this continual debate that people have on how could a loving God send people to hell? And I'm saying to myself, what Bible are you reading? When you make statements like that, you are ignoring the holiness of God and you are ignoring the judgment of God. Okay? There would have been no need for Jesus's for Jesus to die on the cross and for his death to be so brutal if sin didn't have to be paid for and God's holiness and judgment didn't have to be satisfied. So I need to do a whole thing on that because I've heard it my whole life about how people say that God, you know, is so because God is so loving. He couldn't possibly send people to go to hell. So we need to address that because that's a whole other genie concept that people have. I'm like, what Bible are you reading? Okay? But uh, Jesus did mention hell. And when I do this, this teaching on hell, we'll get uh, further into going behind the language. Because again, we're dealing with five words. We're dealing with the English word hell, which does not actually appear in the scripture. We're dealing with Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, and Tartarus. Okay, so Jesus mentions hell in Luke 16 and 19. So let's go there because I do want to read that. 
Okay. So in Luke 16, 19, what the Lord is talking about, he's talking about the rich man and Lazarus. Okay. So I'll just skip to verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. That's a metaphor or a, a euphemism for heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and sent Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So the Lord gives all kind of information about the hell realm, okay? So I just wanted to nod to that, because I'm not going to teach on that tonight, but I do need to do a teaching on that. But the, it's, a phys, it, uh, it's a literal, sorry to say physical, it's a literal place in the spiritual realm. And that's what the Lord is talking about. Hell is, or Hades, or Sheol, Hades is literally a place in the spiritual realm. So do not believe people that tell you that Jesus did not teach on hell at all, but it was not the focus of what the Lord talked about. So Jesus talked about hell in Luke 16, 19. Jesus talked about hell in Mark 9, 47. And Jesus talked about hell in Matthew 13 and 36. So I'm not going to read those tonight, but I wanted to give you the scriptures so you can look them up for yourself. So don't believe people that say that the Lord didn't teach on hell. Yes, he did. But that was not the focus. The focus of what the Lord taught on was the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And again, tonight's message is to contrast that based on what we say, which is born again, born again, get saved, miss hell, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's what we preach. That ain't what the Lord preached. Okay? Now, I want to show you that the Lord's predecessor, okay, the herald, the one that came before Jesus to announce the first advent of Christ, John the Baptist, who was Jesus' first cousin, he said the same thing about the kingdom. And I want to show you where it says that in Scripture. That's in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Okay. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, there we go. Okay. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1, two, verses 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, there you have it. The one that came before the Christ to announce that the Christ was on earth, the first advent of Christ, he said, repent, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? Um, in the New Living Translation, John the Baptist says, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In the NIV version, uh, John says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay? And the New King James and the King James both say the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John preached the kingdom of heaven. How do people miss that? Okay? And John the Baptist was the one that baptized people with water. And John, John the Baptist's water baptism was unto the remission of sins, the outward symbol that people believed that the Christ was here and that the Christ was going to shed his blood and give us the Holy Ghost and give us the inward witness of being born again. Okay? So the outward washing of water with baptism is a symbol of the fact that you believe I have, I have buried my old man. My old man goes down to the water. My sinful self goes into the water. And when I rise out of the water, I'm resurrected to new life like Christ uh, uh, arose out of the grave. That's what water baptism symbolizes. 
okay? And John the Baptist was the one that did the water baptism, and he preached the kingdom of heaven, okay? So now, uh, I want to show you in Matthew 4 and 17, I want to show you how in Matthew 4 and 17, that Jesus said the same thing that John the Baptist said, okay? He wasn't preaching what we preach. He wasn't preaching born again, born again, miss hell, go to synagogue, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's not what he said. In Matthew 4 and 17, uh, the New King James and the King James both say, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now I've shown you in the scripture where both John the Baptist, the predecessor of Christ, the one sent by God to herald or announce or to shine the light that Christ was on earth, said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began to preach, he said, repent for that, excuse me, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. New Living Translation says the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay. NIV says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So right now, then, I want to say, now, can you see how the image in your mind is different if you heard the message that both John the Baptist and Jesus preached, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven has come near you? Because that means that God has given you an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom. And then Jesus taught us in, in uh, John 3 how you get in the kingdom by the rebirth experience, and without the rebirth experience, you can't see it, and you can't even enter. But the kingdom of heaven has come near you, is actually what the Lord preached and what John the Baptist preached. Now, can you see that's in stark contrast to what we American Protestants preach? We tell people to come to church. What if you meet somebody on Tuesday and they die before Sunday? What good has that done them? We need to be teaching what Jesus taught. We need to be preaching what Jesus preached, which is the kingdom of heaven. And that also means, and I'm going to get into this, and I'm not, I'm not going to have time. I'm not near go, nearby going to have enough time to deal with it all tonight. But that means that part of the deficit, part of the failure of us uh, as Christians, and again, I'm just talking about you know American Protestant stuff, stuff in the West. Part of the failure we have as Christians is that we don't know how the kingdom of heaven operates ourselves. And when we don't know how the kingdom of heaven operates, we can't demonstrate it to unbelievers. Because that is what the Lord did. He demonstrated. And he, he gave so many parables, and I'm going to touch on some of them tonight. Might have time to exegete maybe one of them. There's no way I can get through all of them tonight. But the Lord spent the vast majority of his time in the scriptures talking about what the kingdom of heaven was like so that we could understand it. So that's what lets me know that our failure as American Christians, is that we don't know what the kingdom of heaven is like. We don't know what the kingdom of God is like. So if you tell an unbeliever that the kingdom of heaven has come near, they would say, well, what does that mean? Can you explain what it means? If somebody stopped you right now and said, explain what the kingdom of heaven means, explain what the kingdom of God is, and how does it work? Could you do it? Or would you preach Born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. Is that what you know? Is that what your message is? Go to heaven when you die? How do you know when you're going to die? Okay? Is that your message? Go to church, go to church? What if they do die before another Sunday rolls around? Or what if they don't make it to church? See? What the Lord preached was that we now have an opportunity. He said the kingdom of heaven is near. We have an opportunity to tap into God's kingdom and everything that comes along with that, the way God thinks, the way God operates, all of the tools and, and gifts and, and power and revelations of God's kingdom. That's what the Lord preached and that's what he demonstrated. That's what we're supposed to be telling people about, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Can I prove what I just said? We're going to look at Luke 4 and 43. Luke 4 and 43. OK? 
Okay. Uh, New King James and King James. And he said unto them, talking about his disciples, the folks he was talking to, folks that followed him. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. New Living Translation. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. That's Jesus talking. What did Jesus say? Did he say, go to heaven when you die? Did he say, be sure to be a good you know, uh, church member? Be sure to go to church? Well, they went to temple synagogue on Saturday because that's the Sabbath for the Hebrews. Is that what the Lord said? The Lord said, why I was sent, uh, the Amplified Bible says, but he said, Jesus, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because I was sent for this purpose. So what did the Lord say? The Lord said, the reason I was sent, the purpose for which I was sent was to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, not go to heaven when you die, not go to church on Sunday. Not that we shouldn't do those things, but I'm talking about a pre uh, preaching what Jesus preached versus what we preach. Okay? Now I want to show you one more scripture along those lines. I want to show you what the Lord said to the people he sent out. We're going to look at Luke chapter 9 verse 2. Luke chapter 9 verse 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Third book in the New Testament. Luke chapter 9 verse 2 says, He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, I've done teachings on healings in the past because I've met some people who fight healing. But the Bible says, that's why I told you, I'm talking about what the scriptures say, not what I say. The scripture says he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That's part of the manifestation of the kingdom of God is healing, that you don't have to be sick. Uh, Luke 9, 2 in the New Living Translation, then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Uh, Luke 9, 2 in the New International Version, NIV, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. There it is again. So John the Baptist preached, repent. For the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, for this reason was I sent. I was sent for this purpose to preach the kingdom of God, not just in Jerusalem, not just in Nazareth, in his hometown, but in other towns also. For this purpose was I sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And then Luke 9, 2, he sent people to preach. What did he send them to preach? Did they preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell? Go to church, go to heaven when you die. He said, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Because that's one of the benefits of the kingdom of God is that you don't have to live your life sick. Now, see, by now, I hope a different picture is beginning to form in your mind. And you can now see why I entitled this series that we do it wrong. We do it wrong. We preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're not preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. Can you see it? Because when you preach the kingdom of God and when you go forth to heal the sick and when you can lay hands on people and they recover and when they can grow new limbs and when blinded eyes can be opened and when people that don't have strength in their legs can get up and walk and when women that have been told they can't have children after you pray and lay hands on them and do like Elijah and Elisha and say, this time next year, God's going to give you a child. Now they understand the kingdom of heaven has come near to them. And when the power of God comes near to you like that, most people will say, well, I want full benefits. <laughs> Who wouldn't want full benefits? And that's when you talk about being born again, about how you enter the kingdom and get born of the Spirit, get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, get the seal of the Holy Ghost, in your spirit, and now you are in God's kingdom, and now you get to spend the rest of your life 
enjoying, exploring, growing, understanding, and taking full advantage of God's kingdom. And why is that so important? Because the kingdom of man and the kingdom of Satan is corrupted. When, we, when we're born, physically the first time we're born into the devil's kingdom, we're sinners. And we're also born into the natural kingdom of man. Because there's some things that happen to you whether you saved or not. Some things just happen by living. But what you will discover before living too long, you'll be talking about, well, you're that fair. <laughs> you'll discover that Satan's kingdom is corrupt. You'll discover that man's kingdom is corrupt. You'll discover that people hate you because of skin color. You discover that people are trying to cheat you. You discover that people are trying to hurt you, even as a child. Some people are trying to snatch you as a child, trying to snatch you from your parents and run away with you. You'll discover that, that uh, every year, I'm not going to name no names, every year candy bars get smaller and the price gets bigger. <laughs> every, year, every year you will discover that you get charged more for less. And people keep saying, what is that? Why is that? That happened when Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, the kingdom of man became the kingdom of Satan and everything got corrupted. And then God dropped curses. And then now everything's dying. That is so important. And the reason that is important, because you hear me say it all the time. Because we have universal human experiences. That's another reason that the Lord preached the kingdom. There are things that you go through on this planet as a human that we can all relate to regardless of your ethnic background, your age, your gender, your geography, your socioeconomic status, your level of education. There's some stuff we go through by living on earth and a lot of people don't understand why. Why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes you go through stuff and you say, God, why did this happen to me? Why do people sometimes lose their mind and do crazy things and say, I heard voices, because then was demons? All that different kind of stuff. Why has that stuff happened? Well, again, again, it's more than I can talk about tonight, but that's the devil's kingdom. And that's the fallen kingdom of man that got merged together and everything got cursed by the curse of sin when Adam sinned, and it produces death. It produces death. It's why we grow old. If you've ever felt yourself Growing older, if you've seen your skin change, if you felt your body change, anything like that, that's because of the curse of sin. That, these are not the bodies that God gave us originally. The bodies that God gave us originally could have lived forever with no growing old, no arthritis, no Alzheimer's, no dementia, no cancer, no STDs, no osteoporosis. Those are the bodies God first gave us. And then Adam sinned. Then when he sinned, it produced death. And so now man's fallen kingdom and the devil's kingdom is doing nothing but working together to produce death. So that's why we need to preach the proper message, which is the kingdom of heaven, where we can be alive again. The kingdom of God, where we can become born again, become reattached to God, and then learn the benefits and the responsibilities, the, the privileges, the powers, the price, everything that comes along with God's kingdom. Now, again, as I'm talking, I'm hoping you begin to see a different picture form in your mind. Contrast that to what you heard from church. And I'm not saying, you know, we're supposed to go to church. and I'm, I'm not, you know, attacking that. We're supposed to do that. But I'm talking about the messages, especially if you've been in church since you were little, because I've been in church since I was a very little boy, since I was about four or five years old. And I got saved when I was nine. Okay, so think about them. If you've been in church your whole life, think about the messages that you've heard. Think about the messages that you've heard in any type of religious background or any type of denominational context. Context. Now you uh, contrast that to what I just showed you the Bible said, what John the Baptist said, what Jesus said, and the people he sent from him. They all preach the kingdom of God. They all preach the kingdom of heaven. You see that? So that's what I mean when I say we do it wrong. Okay? All right. Now, next part of tonight's teaching is uh, I want to explain to you a little bit about the difference between the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven in terms of why we have those English translations. Um, they're not two different things. Okay? 
kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are, are interchangeable in terms of what they're talking about. But why? Why are they translated differently or why does it look like there's different words? Okay? And that is because of the audiences that the Gospels were aimed at. Okay? Matthew wrote his book primarily to reach a Jewish audience or the Hebrews. If you know anything about Hebrew culture, Hebrews do not write out God's name and they don't speak the name of God. When they write out Jehovah or Yahweh, they take the vowels out. The reason they do that is because they had experience with God, with Moses, way back in the history, where the Lord's glory showed up on the mountain. And it was so terrible until even if an animal touched a mountain by mistake, it, it had to die. And Moses said, the sight was so terrible, I exceedingly tremble and quake. And the Hebrew said, we don't want God to come down here no more like that. So in other words, they had a face-to-face -face encounter. They had a, a, a presence of God encounter. And ever since then, and the third commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So that's why Hebrews, because they saw how awesome and terrible the Lord's name is. They saw how awesome and terrible he is. And they realized when he said, don't take my name in vain, you're not supposed to be playing around with God's name. Because when you call God's name, he shows up. Okay? All power shows up when you call God's name. So that's why Hebrew people take out the vowels when they say the word Yahweh or Jehovah or God. If you've ever seen somebody Jewish write out the word God, they write G asterisk D or G underscore D. They will not write God's name out. They will not write out Jehovah with the vowels and they will not write out Yahweh out of respect for the awesome nature of who God is. That's where that comes from. So Matthew, because he wrote his uh, gospel primarily to a Jewish audience, uses the kingdom of heaven because if he kept saying the kingdom of God, that would probably be offensive and, you know, overturn a few apple carts uh, for the Hebrew audience. Mark wrote for more of a Roman audience, and he has more of an action book, so he uses the kingdom of God. Luke wrote for more of a Greek audience and more of an intellectual or, intellectual or philosophical audience or an audience that's going to think through everything that you're saying, and he used the phrase the kingdom of God. Um, and he, he said in the beginning of his book that he wanted to lay out everything that happened with Jesus in an orderly fashion so that people can understand it. Now, John, John wrote his gospel for pretty much a general audience because John is the one who uses language like, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. And the word was made flesh and, the, and it came into his own and his own received it not. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So John wrote to a general audience to explain who Jesus was to anybody that could believe. So John uses the phrase, phraseology, kingdom of God. So you primarily see the phraseology, kingdom of heaven, in the book of Matthew, because Matthew was primarily targeting that book towards Jews, towards converting Hebrews into believing in Jesus. That's why you see kingdom of heaven and most other places you see kingdom of God but they are interchangeable in terms of what they're talking about okay so I just wanted to clear that up Ooh, Lord I'm almost out of time Phew. so I, I guess we'll call tonight again tonight is part one but it's just like the the foundation or whatever because I wanted to get into some of this stuff I don't even know if I have time now um, so I will just uh, mention it and then next time I do this we're going to have to get into some specifics because I do want you to see this, the specifics. Because if we're supposed to be preaching the kingdom of heaven, and we're supposed to be uh, the kingdom of heaven, and we're supposed to be preaching the kingdom of God, then it would behoove us as believers to know what it is, and to know what we're talking about, and to know how it works. And that's what I wanted to get into tonight, but I'm quickly coming to the close of my hour. So I'm just going to mention some things, and the next time I do this teaching, I'm going to go into more detail on what I'm about to say now. Now, what I'm going to talk about now is some of the analogies or some of the parables or some of the metaphors and euphemisms that Jesus used to describe the kingdom. Now, before I get into that, you might ask the question, what is a parable? A parable is a story that has a deeper meaning. So it's not a story for story's sake. It's not meant to entertain, a parable 
is meant to not just entertain, but also educate. So in other words, you might find it entertaining. And when people listen to Jesus, they might have been entertained by what he said. But the point is not just to entertain, but to educate. So when you see the word parable, it means a story with a deeper meaning. And the Lord told a lot of parables. He told a lot of stories. And again, his purpose there was to educate his audience at a deeper level. But why does Jesus use stories? A lot of people ask that question. That's a good question. The reason that the Lord uses stories is because stories are universal and stories hold up over time. Think about it. If you're telling a story, you can tell that in any generation. Your grandfather can tell that story. Your dad can tell that story. You can tell that story. Your kids can tell that story. Your grandkids can tell the story because stories hold up intergenerationally. Stories hold up over time. And the Lord knew he was speaking to a first century audience. If he had made everything super specific to them, and then we, all these years later, 2,000 plus years later, would have understood what the people listening to him understood. And there, there is some stuff that the Lord talks about where that applies. Like when the Lord told the story of uh, the prodigal son. And when the Lord said he was eating slop with the pigs, every Jewish person knows what that meant. That means he had sunk as low as he could go because the Jews know that the pig is not to be eaten and the pig is a symbol of going as low as you can go because it's a nasty animal. Okay, but Gentiles eat bacon and ham all the time. <laughs> but anyway, so that's why the Lord spoke in parables or stories, because he knew if he told it in story form, pay attention to what I'm saying, if he told it in story form, it would hold up over time, it would hold up intergener uh, intergenerationally, and it would illustrate the deeper points he was trying to make in a way that people can understand. Uh, if you don't know how you learn, how humans learn, the way we learn is whenever new information is introduced to your brain, what your brain does is it does a search, and it searches everything that you know and sees if it can find something it can relate to this new information to what you already know, and then it connects the two. That's actually how we learn in, in our brains if you didn't know that. So new information, your brain does a search, and your brain says, is there anything I can relate this new information to that I already know? And then you connect it to, and that's how you learn new stuff. Okay? So when you understand that, then it makes sense that the Lord would use things that we understand, that we could look at life and say, the kingdom of God is like this, and the kingdom of heaven is like this. He would use things that we can see and that we can understand to connect the deeper meaning of what he was trying to communicate. Let me say that again. The Lord, in using parables and stories because of the way we learn as humans, he would use things that we understood, everyday things, things that people can relate to, and even all these years later, things that we can understand, to connect the deeper meaning of what he was saying about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And the Lord did that all the time. You see what I mean? And so that's part of how we need to grow as Christians. We need to understand the parables of Christ. We need to understand the teachings of Christ in story form so that we can discern the deeper meaning so that when we're ordering our lives as Christians, we can be living according to the deeper meaning of what Jesus was saying. And when we're witnessing to unbelievers, we can say the same thing the Lord said. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God works like this. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, I'm going to read off a list and then I'm going to have to wrap up because my time is just about gone. I'm going to read off a list. Now, these are this is not comprehensive, okay? This is not every place in the Gospels where Jesus talks about it, but these are some of the main stories or parables or analogies that the Lord used to talk about the kingdom of heaven. There is the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 11. There is the parable of the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13, 24. There's the parable of the mustard seed, Matthew 13 and 31. There is the story about the yeast or the leaven or, you know, what you put in bread to make it rise, Matthew 13 and 33. There's a story about the hidden treasure, Matthew 13 and 44. There is the comparison of the pearl of great price, Matthew 13 and 45. 
There's a comparison of it being a dragnet, Matthew 13, 47. Uh, managing business accounts, that's Matthew 18 and 23. Hiring laborers to work while it's day, Matthew 20 and 1. Uh, inviting guests to a wedding celebration. Now, we all understand weddings. That's Matthew 22 and 2. Wise and foolish virgins. Now, you know, I use that one all the time. I talk about the wise and foolish virgins all the time. That's Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Uh, then he talks about business investing or talents. That's talking about money. Matthew 25, 14 through 29. Now, there are other places in Mark, Luke, and John, and I'm going to deal with that, where the Lord talks about those same stories, because I know everything I read was just in Matthew. There are other places in Mark, Luke, and John where we see some of those same stories. But I wanted to give you an overview tonight of how many times the Lord preached and taught about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and how he used stories. He used things that we do understand to help connect it in our brain to relate to things in the spirit that we can't see with our natural eye. You see that? That's what Jesus preached and taught. That's what John the Baptist preached and taught. And when the Lord sent people out, that's what he preached and taught. And there's even a scripture in Acts, let me give you that, where Paul said he had to preach the kingdom of heaven. That's Acts 28 and 30. Okay? So when I come back next month, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, who blessings, uh, Victoria, God bless you. What I'm going to do is we're going to start to look at some of those stories. Because as I said, the whole purpose of my No More Genies broadcast and the whole purpose of this series entitled We Do It Wrong is, as I said at the beginning of the hour, we preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, uh, go to church. I know, but you can watch the replay. Uh, you can watch the replay. Uh, you know, miss hell, miss hell, uh, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's the kind of stuff that we say. And that ain't what the Lord said. That's the point I want to emphasize on this first part one. John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven. Jesus the Christ preached the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He sent people out to preach the kingdom of heaven. Apostle Paul preached the kingdom of heaven. So that's what I mean when I say we do it wrong. So we've got to understand the stories that Jesus told about the kingdom of heaven so that we can understand the deeper truth in there so that first and foremost, we can live in it. What good does it do us as Christians to be born again and not take full advantage of the kingdom because Jesus suffered a painful and a brutal death to give us the rebirth experience so we could see and get into the kingdom? What good does it do for the Lord to die in that manner, to allow himself to be arrested and spit upon and beaten? And, and, and the crown of thorns placed on his head and a spear pierced in his side and nailed to the cross in his hands and his feet and died on the cross for six hours and whipped brutally. What good does it do for Jesus to pay that kind of price so that we can get born again and get in the kingdom and then not understand how the kingdom works? That doesn't even make any sense, does it? And why would the Lord go through all that and then we become born again and then we don't take full advantage Full advantage, I'm going to say it one more time, full advantage of what Jesus died to give us in the kingdom. That doesn't even make any sense. And that is why so many people just have religion. And that is why so many people have something that's dead and dull and you fall asleep listening to them. And that's why there's no power and all that because all that what they talk about and what the Lord talks about. Can you see it? So I'm going to leave it right there for tonight because uh, my hour is gone. There's a few more things I need to do before I go. But when I come back on on the second Thursday, uh, this is June, right? right? When I come back on the second Thursday of July, we're going to pick up right there and we're going to start to examine some of the stories that Jesus told so that we can get to the deeper meaning and start to apply it to our lives. Once we apply it to our lives, then it's going to begin to manifest in your life. And then people are going to start walking up to you and saying, how did you get that to manifest? And then you can start preaching what Jesus preached, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. That's how I got it. Can you see it? Okay. All right. Praise God. I'm super excited about this teaching. I knew I wasn't going to have time to get into everything tonight, but I'm super excited about this teaching because it's revolutionary. It's going to change our lives. It's going to make our Christian lives start to make sense. 
instead of just being full of religion that has no power and going through motions. We're actually going to tap into the secrets of what Jesus himself taught to teach us how the kingdom of heaven works. And once you get a taste of the kingdom of heaven, you will never want to go back to the kingdom of darkness. You will never want to listen to the devil again. Once you see the success that's possible in the kingdom of God, it's just like, like the Bible says, he sent him to heal the sick. Once you get well, why would you ever want to be sick again? Once you feel loved, why would you ever go back to feeling unloved again? And once you learn how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you learn how to flow in the apostolic, you learn how to flow in the prophetic, and God starts telling you stuff before it happens. Why would you ever want to go back to being ignorant again and just going through life with no kind of warning? When God starts telling you, God starts dropping stuff in you that in the fall this is going to happen, and by Christmas this is going to happen, and in 2020 this is going to happen, why would you ever want to go back to being uninformed again? See, that's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're supposed to be preaching, and that's where we're supposed to be living. Okay? All right. So what I'm going to do now, uh, you know, with every broadcast, I go, I speak in tongues, and I go into the Holy Ghost, and I ask the Holy Ghost, is there any uh, deliverance needed? Is there any physical healing needed? Anything about finances and any other prophetic words he wants me to release before we sign off, okay? So when you see me close my eyes and I'm speaking in tongues, that's what I'm doing. Okay, the Holy Ghost is saying some of you are having problems with your eyes. So do what I'm about to do. Take both your hands, put them on your eyes and say, in the name of Jesus, I command my eyes to be 100% whole and I cast any unclean spirits, any spirits of blindness or hindrance of sight, I cast you out in Jesus' name and I command my eyes to be 100% whole, 20-20 vision in my eyes, uh, my blood vessels, my arteries, my veins, my eyeball, every part of my eye, my cornea, my lens. In Jesus' name, I command you to be 100% whole. And I command you to see in Jesus' name. Do it just like you just saw me do it, and you'll feel the power of God flow through your eyes. Okay, the Holy Ghost is telling me that uh, somebody's having problems with their knees. Put your hands on your knees and say, In the name of Jesus, I speak to my knee. And I command my knee to be every whit whole. I, con I command my knee to bend without pain. I command my knees to support the weight it needs to support. And I command my knees to be in the proper place on my leg. Nothing misaligned, nothing broken, nothing missing. Ooh, see, I'm feeling that power shoot through my legs as a top. So in the name of Jesus, I command my knees to be 100% whole in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mm. Yep, see, I'm feeling that while I'm talking. That's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it's the kingdom of God in operation. Prophetic word, for behold, my people, the days come and now are, where I will begin to manifest the fullness of my kingdom to you, where I will begin to show you great and mighty things that you didn't know, where I will show you how to fully operate in my kingdom, and I will give you victory. Victory over everything the devil does. Victory over everything the devil's ever said to you or wicked people. Victory over every bad seed, every bad idea, every bad thought that Satan or a wicked person has ever put into your mind and your spirit. Behold, I will begin to expound my kingdom unto you and show you how my kingdom is greater and that you can overcome every negative thing that's ever been birthed into you. Those days are here now, so take advantage of them and learn to walk in my kingdom, says the Spirit of the living God. Wow, I'll take it. Amen. I'll take it. <laughs> the Lord wants to open up deeper revelations of the kingdom and give us victory over every, every attack of the devil, devil every lie of the devil, everything that the devil has ever done to you. The Lord says you can overcome that through his kingdom. Don't you want to overcome? Don't you want to overcome? I don't care how long you've been down or under or afflicted or whatever. 
The Lord just told us by the Holy Ghost that when we begin to study his kingdom, he's going to open it up to us and show us how we can beat every single thing Satan has ever tried to do to us. Wow, that's what I'm talking about. That right there is what I'm talking about. What an advantage to be able to, to be a part of a, of a kingdom to where you can overcome everything the devil's trying to do to you. Because some of us got some testimonies, boys. Some of us can go back in the past and some stuff, if we told it, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff that the devil has tried to put us through. You wouldn't believe it. But the Lord says that in his kingdom, his kingdom is greater and we can overcome. Wow. I received that. I'm, I'm, yes. My answer is yes. I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Amen and amen. Well, remember, uh, oh yeah, I want to let you know I do have my Zelle set up because several of you have asked about sowing into my ministry. You can sow into my ministry through Zelle. Uh, ProfitDavidTaylor at gmail.com is my email. P-R-O-P-H-E-T-D-A-V-I-D-T-A-Y-L-O-R, Prophet David Taylor, all together at gmail.com. Now, I'm going to put that on uh, my Facebook page and then also on my YouTube channel. So you can watch the replay. If you didn't watch it live, you can watch the replay on Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. And I put all those links on the Facebook page. Uh, and, um, cause sometimes, you know, there's some stuttering and sometimes there's some skipping or whatever. So that's why I put up different versions because not all the versions stutter, not all the versions skip. So if you want to watch, you know, a clean one that didn't have any dropouts, you can check out those other replays. And, uh, again, if you want to donate to my ministry, uh, my Zelle account is set up. And so it's prophet David Taylor at gmail.com. And you can also write me there if you want prayer. If you want prayer for anything, you can put it below the Facebook video, or write me at my email and say, Prophet, I'd like you to pray over something. I'd be happy to pray. So if you have any uh, prayer requests now, put them on the screen uh, before I uh, sign out. Anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen. Now, if I don't see it come up, I'm not ignoring you. I just literally don't see it on my screen. And if I go back on the replay and I see a prayer request, I will pray right then because I don't always see everything that pops up on my screen uh, when I'm broadcasting live, okay? All right, so thank you so much for tuning in live. Those of you that tuned in live, I'm excited about this teaching. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about beginning to walk in the full advantage of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. I'm excited about the Lord explaining his parables, his deeper meanings, about the Lord showing us how to take advantage and how to overcome everything the devil's trying to do. Wow, so I'm excited. So no, I'm sorry. I didn't see your request, Victoria. I didn't, it didn't come up. Uh, if you're on Periscope, I probably won't be able to see it until I sign up. But put it up there again. I'll pray again. So, Victoria, put up your request again on Periscope so we can pray right now. Tell me what it is you want me to pray for. Prayer. Oh, okay. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Victoria. She needs a healing, Lord, in groin, hip, and lower back areas. So, right. Okay. Uh, Victoria, put your... Put your left hand on your stomach and put your right hand on the small of your back and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak life to my groin, my hip and my lower back area. In the name of Jesus, I speak order and correction and let everything be properly aligned in my groin, my hip and my back area. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak life to my groin and hip and back area and I command it to be 100% whole. I speak peace and shalom, nothing broken, nothing missing, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I demand it and declare it. Amen. Now, the Lord is also telling me to tell you to don't give up on that. Don't uh, let the devil make you back off that. Say that every day. If the devil tries to bring the pain back, say it every day, because I felt the power of God inside of me when I said it right there with you. So say it every day, and you'll feel the Holy Ghost manifest and don't let anybody or any demon or Satan himself take that from you. Okay? Amen and amen. Uh, so, yes, I'm excited. I'm excited. So excited. All right. So, uh, now, you are welcome. God bless. This Sunday is Father's Day. So, I'm not sure yet if I'm going to be available at 2.30. 
I might be out uh, with my son, and we're not quite sure what that's going to happen. So, um, uh, you know, I, I may pre-record something, or I may not be live on Sunday because it's family time, so I'm not sure. So I, I, I check with my different channels to see. I'll let you know exactly what's going to happen on Sunday because it is uh, Father's Day. So check Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitter, and I'll put something up there to let you know exactly what's going to happen. But for sure, I'll be back the following Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time at my regular time where we do the weekly live prophetic word, and I'll be back next month. Thank you for that Father's Day blessing, Victoria. God bless you. And I'll be back next month on the second Thursday of July to continue this teaching on the kingdom of God with my No More Genies broadcast. Okay? Thank you so much. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy your weekend. And remember, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand, and it's time to take full advantage of it. God bless.